Yeah, thank you very much. Very bulky title. But in the end, you know, I had a couple of very good interviews with journalists uh, during the show, and they kept on asking three questions. First one is, what is this software-defined vehicle really about? And what does it mean to separate hardware from software? And the third one is, what's your role as a tier one supplier in that context? And uh, today, I would like to give you a couple of answers to that one, and also a sketch a way forward for the industry. Now, looking around uh, the show here, you see there's a couple of what I would call transformation vectors to the industry. The first one is, of course, the transformation in powertrains. The next one is that many companies are now going to deliver automated driving experiences to their customer. The third one is the digital life of consumers needs to go into the vehicles. And all that uh, generates a lot of transformation impulses to the industry. At the same time, a car is not a smartphone. A car is not a smartphone because, I mean, what the industry has to deliver is still we have to develop platforms, vehicle models have to be created to various countries, various caps, various um, different, uh, say, um, model variants. And, and therefore, the challenges of the automotive industry still stays the same. At the other side, there's something really new coming on. In the old days, basically, the model cycles were every six years, you had a new car model, and then you did an update and stuff like that. And I showed it here with the Volkswagen Golf, uh, just as an example, how the model cycles of that vehicle run. But now technology is evolving so fast, and I try to illustrate it here with the structural bandwidths of semiconductor production, for example. But you could go to AI and all the kind of stuff. So the technological development is by far outpacing the classical development of vehicles. And in order to keep vehicles fresh and up to date, we have to do something about that. Now, um, there's three things the industry is discussing. The first one to accommodate with this complexity is first to separate user functions from hardware deliveries. The second one to enable this is to build something like an operating system. And the third one is to go for centralized vehicle architectures because if you have tons of different ECUs in your vehicle, you will never be able basically to capture and abstract the hardware layer from the software layer. So this is really important and I will come to all of these points in the following of my talk. First one is operating systems. So um, a couple of years ago there was really a hype with that and I tried to illustrate that with the Gartner hype cycle here. All the OEMs claimed, we do our own proprietary operating system. This is what we have to do in order to cope with this complexity. Everybody was really full confident, as the automotive industry usually is. So we're doing that. Looking from outside as a supplier, we see that only very, very, very few are successful with that. The others, I would say, are now in a phase of disillusionment or recalibrating their strategies for a very good reason. First, an operating system doesn't deliver any value to the end customer. I mean, we are all using our smartphones and our PCs. Basically, we don't care whether there is a Windows system in there, whether an iOS, what type of Android, we don't care. It doesn't deliver any value. The second one, maintaining software of the type is really a complex task. You know, I started in software development many years ago, and as a student, when I programmed a version 1.0 Greenfield, that was always very easy. It became then complex when I had to do bug fixes, I had to do rollouts, I have to do new versions. Then the thing gets really complicated, and only, I think, very capable software organizations are able to deliver operating systems at reasonable cost levels, enabling the software-defined vehicle and giving the OEMs the possibility to deliver user functions which really provide tangible benefits to their car buyers. The next one I would like to touch is centralized architectures. As I said before, in order to do that really thoroughly, you need to centralize your vehicle functions uh, to vehicle computers. And if you look at the OEM landscape, and I try to depict it here in this complicated diagram on the left-hand side, if you look at all the OEMs, we see that only a very few are already at the point where they have a very consistent centralized architectures in their vehicles. So these are the green ones. Some of them, this is the light blue ones, are in a transition phase towards uh, these. 
and uh, the dark blue ones are still staying there. Now, we also see that many OEMs have that in their strategy, but what we see also is that many OEMs are postponing their ambitious plans for centralized architectures. And there's a very good reason for that one, because many of the traditional OEMs have legacy for a good reason. And now you start, you have a new concept with centralized uh, ECUs, and then the guy comes and says, hey, I have a lightning ECU, I have a door ECU, I have whatever ECU still needs to be incorporated, this is source, this is in the vehicle architectures. And so it's very difficult for most of the industry to generate greenfield approaches to generalized, uh, centralized architectures. And this is a big challenge. So the automotive industry really is in a transition phase, and the key question is, with all the challenges ahead, how do we leverage that? Acknowledging the past, envisioning the future, and now defining a path from past to future. Now, if it comes to centralized architectures, and I think this is something which is already clear in the industry, we have to go for domains. So we are not talking about doors or back or trunk or whatever. So we are talking ADAS, driver assistance. We are talking the motion domain, energy domain, body and comfort, and infotainment. All of them have the same issue, basically, if it comes to centralization and to software-defined vehicles. You know, we had a very interesting meeting with the board of a big OEM a couple of months ago, and those guys really asked me, why the hell do I need software defined? I mean, our cars are selling well. I mean, we have good customer relationship. Uh, it's all good. Why should we do that? And I told them one thing, it's already happening now. And sorry for getting a little technical in the next uh, couple of minutes. We are now talking the infotainment domain. In infotainment domain, software defined and centralized is already here since years. Companies like Google, Apple, Baidu, and all the others are actually in there. The user front end of many vehicles is smartphone-like. Now you can argue whether you integrate these functions into OEM-specific user interfaces, but the time in infotainment where the OEMs could sell for a couple of thousand dollars, head units with user functions, that's basically over because the digital experience of the car users is already there. Now the question comes, what does the automotive industry have to do? Of course, we have to build powerful SOCs, integrate them uh, into ECUs. We have to use POSIX, Android type of operating systems, and define a layer on top on which you can then actually integrate all these different um, user functions, all these different apps. They are updated very frequently, and they are not safety critical. So, guys, software-defined vehicle is already there in the infotainment domain, no matter what. And uh, the, the role of a tier one is basically to integrate that, provide the ECUs, and make sure uh, that the uh, user functions stay really fresh up and running. Now you may say, okay, infotainment, this is very special. We have Apple, Google, and the others there. Um, this is not relevant for safety critical systems. But it's now also happening for safety critical systems because in the ADA space, if we are talking for automated driving functions, which are basically AI-driven, this is now happening as well. So for ADAS functions, you need powerful computers, supercomputers with high-performance SOCs. You typically put on these uh, SOCs a safe POSIX system on top of that. And then you need to have very intelligent middleware systems because in the end, the ADAS function is safety critical. We are talking ACL, we are talking time critical systems, and the POSIX systems is not safety proven. So what we have to do in order to abstract user functions like automated driving, automated parking is to integrate very sophisticated middleware systems, brokering between AI-based user functions and the, the, the properties of a POSIX-based operating system. So what we do as a tier one here is uh, we have developed a component. This is called AOS. This is a fully recomputable, certified, proven middleware component. And this is a product we are selling, and we are engaging with the Volkswagen Group into the development on automated driving functions, because we think that together with the Volkswagen Group, we can really leverage our competence on software uh, and functions, together with them integrating them in vehicles, collecting data, and so on. Okay? Now, the guys from Powertrain and Motion, they keep on telling me, yeah, okay, this is now ADAS, nice, 
but in the core functions where it's really tough, hardcore, real-time, this will never happen with a software-defined one. However, it does. We as Bosch uh, have won a CES award earlier this year for a component we call vehicle motion management. You know, vehicle motion management is a function which sits on top of a brake-by-wire, a steer-by-wire system, and an electrical powertrain. And the funny thing is you can develop and deploy functions which are absolutely revolutionary. They don't run on an ESP system. They don't run on a steering ECU. They're just sitting on top. And basically, um, if you watch the videos uh, on LinkedIn or on the web, with this function, you can make a very A-class car with a driving uh, behavior of a Porsche 911. This is just amazing what is possible just with software. And in order to enable that, same story, user function on top, you have to have powerful middleware systems to abstract that, and then in the end, you abstract that down to a microcontroller. Really important. So the key message here is it started from infotainment, it went in the ADAS domain, and it's now going all the way through to the powertrain systems. All those have different challenges, but for paradigmatically, all of them have the thing Software, functional software goes away. You have to have a broker layer uh, on the middleware operating system and you have powerful SOCs underneath it. Now, the key question I'm asked from the OEMs basically for the non-functional parts of that, well, it's nice, but in the old days, we were shipping, we shipping software like this one. So there was a car model build, we developed the software, this went into this, uh, in the ECUs, Six years later, when the new model happened, basically you could discard the software, you develop that all over again. So this is this um, chainsaw type of pattern like we did software development. Now in the new world, and I think the tech players who have presented also here on stage, they show us that we need to go for continuous software development. And then everybody can make a contribution, somebody has to maintain that, and of course we need to frame business models around that. This is really important because otherwise the complexity is really overwhelming us and also from a cost perspective we are getting a problem. So key message here is the classical way of developing non and shipping non-functional software in the automotive industry will have to change and is changing. Now you may ask, and this is uh, my last slide, is this a problem for us as a tier one supplier? There's one number on the bottom right side of this slide. In Bosch, we are shipping every year 250 million ECUs with our own software. 250 million ECUs. So this is explaining that we, as a say, software oriented tier one, we can do software, we can deploy software, we can operationalize software, and we can ship software um, like other tech companies out there can do. We have all these capabilities, building ECU and that stuff. So my key request here is that the automotive industry, they used to be a little bit too overconfident in the last years about their software capabilities. But in the end, a car is not a smartphone. A car is not a PC. A car is something special, but it takes over paradigms from software industry. So my key request is we should bundle forces we should use our classical virtues, our classical DNA as software-driven companies in the automotive space, partner, of course, with companies like the one we had before, bring in their technology, and then scale it up at co reasonable cost in the automotive industry to develop and supply superior value to the end customer. Thank you very much.